Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Blink Now's gender equity discussion. I'm Beth Holly, and I am delighted to be co-hosting this event and look forward to an enlightening discussion on a topic of great global interest with a very local impact on women and girls in Nepal. I've been following and supporting the work of Blink Now for many years with a particular interest in the work they're doing to support women and girls, and I'm thrilled to be able to participate in this important discussion with apologize, apologies for the background noise. Um, I'm joined today by my co-host, Yagdash Uptya. Jagdish is, a, excuse me, Jagdish is a member of the Blink Now board and this topic is very close to his heart. Um, specifically, he is a big advocate for reproductive health and rights. And Jagdish, would you like to say hello to our guests? Hello everyone. I'm so delighted to be part of this great event and particularly I personally know Latanya, Maggie and Bharti. And I know uh, through their work, they have supported thousands of women and girls in many countries. So they are really my heroes, including so by you with your achievement. Without further ado, back to you, Beth. Wonderful. Thank you. And so I'm going to dive right in because we've got a lot to share with you in a short period of time. So I'm going to introduce our first speaker, uh, Latanya Mapfret. Latanya is president and CEO of Global Fund for Women and serves on the board of directors for Global Fund for Women and Global Fund for Women UK. As a feminist fund, Global Fund for Women offers flexible support to a diverse group of partners, more than 5,000 groups across 175 countries so far, to create meaningful change that will last beyond our lifetimes. Previously, she was the executive director of Planned Parenthood Global and worked for eight years as a human rights officer for the United Nations Children's Fund, or UNICEF, and for 10 years with the United States Agency for International Development. So I'm happy to welcome Latanya to the chat and turn it over to you. Thank you so much. It's so good to see you, Jagdish, and thank you so much for this invitation to be here with Blink Now. Um, you know, I was just remarking that 25 years ago, actually about 26, I started this work um, in Beijing at a conference where the, the tone of women's rights or, humans right, or human rights um, was actually so controversial. And it brings us to today where I'm going to speak a little bit about the global status of gender inequality and women's empowerment. And I'll just focus um, on a few topics with all of you here today. I want to talk about the power of movements that we're seeing around the world and then the increasing crises that we're also facing and how women are leading change with those crises. And then I think I want to end with the inspiring next generation of leaders, youth and girls who are not just the leaders of tomorrow, but they're leading the way today. So thank you again. It's such a pleasure to be able to think back to when Global Fund for Women first started 35 years ago with the notion that if we would just fund women um, and give them unrestricted, trust-based, long-term grants, that they will be able to change the world. And as I talk, you'll see that that was the right way to go. But the bottom line is activists are mobilizing globally for change right now. Women, girls, people within LGBTQI communities, and many more are mobilizing in revolutionary ways against harassment, discrimination, violence, and oppression. From the Maria Verde, the Green Wave Movement, to the Red Umbrella Movement, to Me Too and Ni Una Minos, from Lebanon to Sudan, Iraq to Chile, people around the world are demanding a more equal world through protesting, organizing, marching, and movement building, and feminists are on the front lines of these revolutionary actions. These movements are occupying online and offline spaces, activating across sectors and geographies, and building broad-based and intersectional constituencies. And we've learned feminist movements work. Research is showing that these broad-based social movements are one of the most effective mechanisms to create and sustain long-term social transformation. Over the past 50 years, women's movements have led to more egalitarian workplace regulations, more equitable land rights, better access to financial institutions, expanded legal protections for domestic workers, and protection from sexual harassment. But movements are 
continuously underfunded and lack access to resources and support. These movements need funding and resources to strengthen and sustain their powerful grassroots organizing. Often, it is the same multifaceted structure that makes them so effective that has also rendered them challenging for donors and allies to reach with funds and support. My organization, Global Fund for Women, has recently doubled down on supporting these powerful movements for gender justice, and we are seeing their power daily. We are in a time of change and great possibility globally, and I'm hopeful. So moving to our crisis work, it's not a moment too soon. There are more intersecting crises in the world today than we have ever witnessed before. Authoritarianism is on the rise, climate disasters are ravaging our homes, and deadly rollbacks to abortion rights in the US, Poland, and elsewhere are threatening decades of, of gains for reproductive justice. Women often take on the brunt of crisis response, acting as frontline healthcare workers, unpaid caregivers, and community mobilizers, communities have become vulnerable to increased gender-based violence and lost access to sexual and reproductive health services, as well as disruptions to their livelihoods and financial security. Let's, let's talk a little about the example of Afghanistan. I was thinking I was there working on the border of Quetta 20 years ago this day, and the Taliban has taken over again. Um, Afghanistan, as, and they're now the ruling power. This is a critical crisis for women, girls, and marginalized communities across Afghanistan. This is what we're hearing from our advisors in the region. Health clinics and refugee facilities are overwhelmed. Some universities are now closed to women. Women are being removed from their work post. Schools are being segregated by gender and basic resources like food and shelter are scarce. So at Global Fund for Women, we've supported grassroots groups working for human rights in Afghanistan, not yesterday, not during the evacuation, but for over two decades, because long-term consistent commitment is required. And we will continue to support partners working for gender justice in Afghanistan in the greater region today, tomorrow, and in the years to come. And the activists on the ground continue their work, despite these seemingly impossible circumstances. Dr. Sakina Yakuba, my friend who founded the Afghan Institute of Learning, which has educated thousands of girls under the Taliban, recently explained, while we are afraid, we are not defeated. Ideas do not disappear so easily. One cannot kill whispers in the wind. The Taliban cannot crush a dream we will prevail even if it takes longer than we wanted it to. I think this is so powerful and it speaks to the power of change makers and movements. But let's talk about the work of the youth and this climate of movements for social change and increasing need due to crisis. I have enormous hope and I get that from activists like Dr. Yakuba, but also from young people Young people and particularly adolescent girls are driving today's gender justice movements and building a more just and equitable world for all. We have an adolescent girls advisory council and I am floored by the work they do and the insights they bring. The council is made up of 12 girls from 12 different countries around the globe and is driving key strategic decisions across the organization, including how to redistribute funds and other resources through our Adolescent Girls' Rights Program. I'm incredibly inspired by them and all the young women leaders, from Amanda Gorman to Malala to Greta Thunberg. If we can get out of the way and let more of these young people come to the table and lead, we will see enormous strides. I know youth empowerment and engagement is a core part of Blink Now, so I wanted to end on that note. And I will turn it back over to Beth and to the other speakers to tell us more about that youth engagement work and beyond. And again, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Latanya. It's so impressive to hear the work that you've been doing and the fact that you've been doing it for as long as you have really does emphasize how critically important it is that we act now and consistently um, because this is an issue that affects us all. So um, at this point, I'm gonna welcome our second speaker who is Bharti Silawal Giri. Ms. Silawagiri is a national of Nepal and started her career as a radio journalist in 1976 
as the English news anchor in Radio Nepal. She is also the founding member of the Human Rights Organization of Nepal and was active in the 1990 People's Movement in Nepal. She has more than 30 years of experience in mainstreaming gender equality and social inclusion and has worked with the UN at the national, regional, and headquarters levels on these issues. She is active in various human rights institutions and NGOs and is one of the founding members of the Intergenerational Feminist Forum. She is providing traction to the feminist movement in Nepal. So I'm thrilled to welcome her to our, our group today to talk specifically about what the experience is like in Nepal. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Beth. And namaste to everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. And I'm really thrilled to be speaking on a subject that is so close to my heart. So um, let us see what is the status of gender equality and women's empowerment in Nepal. In the last uh, 20, uh, sorry, in the last 31 years, uh, Nepal has undergone significant economic and political transitions. Together with this, progress has also been made in terms of women's representation in decision-making bodies. Uh, for example, there are 33% of women in federal and provincial parliaments and 41% of elected women in local government bodies. And this has happened because of affirmative actions. Women's participation in the civil service is in also increasing steadily. It now stands at 24%. In the security sector, women comprise 5.7% in Nepal police, 4.9% in the armed police force, and 3.2% in the Nepal army. Now this has happened because of affirmative actions, because of the principles of CEDAW that says that affirmative actions are important for achieving substantive equality. And Nepal is a uh, party, state party to CEDAW. Gender parity has almost been achieved in secondary education level, owing to the concerted efforts by the government over the years to achieve equal access to universal education. In fact, this year's education budget has received 8 billion rupees, Nepali rupees, more than last year. But the bulk of the budget is appropriated for salaries, making the task of achieving quality education challenging for developing girls' and boys' capabilities. Maternal mortality rates have also been reduced from 470 per 100,000 live births in 2003 to 186 in 2017. Likewise, child mortality rates have decreased from 264.4 deaths, point six, sorry, 264.6 deaths per 1,000 live births in 1970 to 30.8 deaths per 1,000 live births in 2019. This can be attributed to the availability of health services in rural areas as well. Favorable policy frameworks towards women's empowerment and gender equality focus on improving women's political, economic, and social status, and several legislations criminalize domestic violence, rape, marital rape, trafficking, allegations of witchcraft, and harmful traditional practices. Now, I've given you this data to show you how women's status has progressed in Nepal. And these progress are real, the data that I've quoted to you. But then let us scratch the surface to uncover the true picture of gender equality and women's empowerment in Nepal today. That is why I'm very thankful to the organizers, to the organizers and particularly to Jagdish Ji for inviting me today to dwell on this extremely important topic. Nepal ranks 115th out of the 162 countries in the Gender Inequality Index. The Gender Inequality Index captures women's disadvantages in three dimensions. One, reproductive health, two, empowerment, and three, economic activity. And as you all know, gender inequality is one of the greatest barriers to human development, entrenched forms of inequality. It is very complex as well. And these gender disparities compound other disadvantages as well. 
Today, Nepal is a secular federal republic that guarantees equality, non-discrimination, and economic prosperity. Although women throughout history have played a significant role in ushering these changes, they still remain at the receiving end. And why? Firstly, the patriarchal social system is strongly embedded within political structures and cultures. The, uh, the preamble of the constitution explicitly commits to ending all forms of discrimination and oppression created by the feudalistic, please note the words, feudalistic, autocratic, centralized unitary system of governance. But it does not mention doing away with patriarchy, the sole reason why women are still treated as second-class citizens and are debarred from conferring citizenship rights to their children. Today, thousands of children are stateless, who live a life of limbo as they do not have access to education, decent job, bank accounts, and security, as all of these require citizenship certificates. The situation is even more difficult for those children born out of sexual violence perpetrated by both sides in the armed conflict era in Nepal. 9,000 plus women lost their husbands. There is no data on how many women's husbands have disappeared. Apart from living out the trauma of the armed conflict era on a daily basis, they are not able to engage in productive economic activities as they do not have assets and property to use as collaterals for taking loans from banks and financial institutions because they lack proof of their husband's debts. So together with survivors of conflict-related sexual violence, they have been denied compensation as the government does not recognize them as conflict victims. Moreover, the two transitional justice mechanisms, the TRC and CIEDP, have not been able to fulfill their mandates so justice is a long haul for them. As such, women lag behind in all spheres of life, whether it is in literacy, whether it is in terms of education, whether it is in terms of employment. And as you know, uh, Nepal ranks 14 among the 15 countries with the highest global prevalence of physical intimate partner violence. There is a state of impunity against violence against women and girls owing to traditional mediation practices in the absence of gender responsive organizational systems and practices. And this was all the more evident during the COVID lockdown period. And frequent bans on seeking employment in domestic work abroad also have exacerbated the vulnerabilities of women to trafficking. Nepal has one of the highest proportions of informal employment in the world, with over 90% jobs in the informal sector, which is not protected by legislation or safety nets, even though the informal economy contributes 38.4% to the GDP of the country. And therefore, during the lockdown, and which were quite frequent, imposed by the government to contain the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic, it hit hard these women working in the informal sector. That together with women's unpaid work in the household, together with the engagement in the informal sector, which is the backbone of the productive economy, continues to be insufficiently protected by legislation or safety nets. And this makes even women in their old age extremely poorer than men. So we need to ask ourselves, why are there such structural imbalances between men and women? Is this because they are incapable? Is it because they deserve to be invisible? Is it because this is how the state of affairs should be? Why, in spite of women's contributions to the productive economy, it has not led to their economic empowerment? Why have political transitions not led to a gender balance in all walks of life? Why are the majority of women civil servants at the bottom hierarchy of decision making? Why has increased representation of women in elected positions not yet led to political empowerment? Uh, a short while ago, Latane spoke of the Beijing uh, conference. Now, the Beijing Plus 25 review reveals that gender mainstreaming as a strategy has been successful because more governments now are adopting gender responsive legal frameworks, plans, programs, and budgets. 
But what has not changed at the family and society levels are the patriarchal social norms and values that devalue women and girls and objectify them using violence as a tool to suppress and oppress girls and women into submission. Over the years, the feminist movement in Nepal has diversified to encompass the voices of youths, women and excluded groups, which is a growing powerful force. But then women from Adibasis, Janajatis, Dalits, um, Dalits, Madesis, Muslims, and other marginalized groups, such as the LGBTQIA, are yet to be part of the mainstream women's movement. And just like other movements elsewhere, in Nepal too, the women's and feminist movement is bifurcated along the lines of caste, class, other diversities, and particularly political ideologies. So this is really not helping the women's movement. At the current rate of progress, it will take 150 years to achieve political equality at par with men, 70 years to achieve women's economic empowerment, and 202 years to reduce the gender gap. So owing to this uh, realization, women from different backgrounds, age, experience, education, caste, class, and religion have come together to form the Intergenerational Feminist Forum, IGFF. The main objectives of the IGFF are to establish equality, political, economic, legal, social, and religious among and between all the sexes by dismantling the structures of patriarchy that perpetuate and sustain inequality, discrimination, oppression, and violence through collective voice and collective feminist leadership. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bharti. That is, uh, it's fascinating as we, as we narrow our scope from the global and now bringing it down to the actual experience in Nepal. Really, it's tremendous um, information and work that you're doing. I'm going to bring us down even a little bit more locally now and introduce our next speaker, who is Shova Mala. Shova is one of the first children to graduate from the Coppola Valley Children's Home and transition to Blink Now's Young Adults program. After finishing the 12th grade in Circuit, she went on to pursue an undergraduate degree at Lafayette College in Easton, Pennsylvania, where she currently lives. Shova is a senior there, a double major in economics and environmental studies, and she is an active board member at the International Student Association and the Asian Student Association at Lafayette. So I welcome Shova to share with us her own personal uh, journey and experience. Thank you, Shova. Thank you so much. Um, namaste, everyone. So I'm Sova, and like you heard, I'm one of the first children to graduate from Kopila Valley Children's Home, and right now I'm in Eastern Pennsylvania at Lafayette College. Um, I'm so honored to share this space with you today and speak for gender and empowerment. And I'll be sharing my story to emphasize the role of opportunity and role of education. Um, I'm here today solely because of this incredible opportunity that education has given me. And I want to begin by sharing some of my first memories that I have of the place that I was born in, Kalikot. Kalikot lies in the foothills of Himalayas, which at that time was only reached by foot as there was no other means of transportation. In my first memories, I see flashes of a stone carved tap that is so tall that I have to uh, turn my neck all the way up like this to see the top. Then I see these two yellow buckets that I used to carry water to and from my house every day. Um, and then I see this green field that I'm running around trying to find cucumbers that my mom planted because she knows those are my favorite. And she's cutting grass nearby. And then I see this gigantic snow slide with a water spring at the end. That means that every time I slide down, I get soaked in the pool of water. So those are all my favorite memories. And then there are these other memories that I have are very confusing. I see all these men with uniforms and guns. They live with me, with my mom and me. And the last memory of, and the last memory I have is of being carried, carried in a wooden basket one early morning on someone's back. So when I was seven years old, I was enrolled in Kopira Valley Children's Home. And many things had happened by then. My parents and I had been living in India for five years as refugees under, uh, during the Maoist insurgency in Nepal. We were separated as a family. 
Some days I would live with some grandparents for months while my parents went to work on construction sites and they had to move around a lot. I was separated from my two other siblings who were enrolled in another children's home in another city so that they could get an opportunity for healthy food and education. My bro younger brother lived with us, but he did not believe that he has two other siblings because we rarely saw them. After moving into Kopila Valley Children's Home, I got an amazing opportunity for life. Opportunity to go to school, be close with my family members, and find a sense of belongingness. My parents got an opportunity to live a dignified life in their own country, the only world they ever knew of, uh, and all those years they'd longed to go when they were in India. You see, I consider myself very lucky to be part of Kopila Valley. Many of my peers back home in Calico did, did not get the same opportunity as me. They're either married with children or are in Gulf countries working to send remittance back home. My older sister will be the first person in my village to get a PhD, and I'll be the first person to get a degree from the United States. I believe that once you have the access, the resources, and desire for education, you're able to move past the cycle of poverty. You begin to realize that there are so many endless ways to life. My wish is for every woman to have the chance at education, to have chance for agency, and live a dignified life. Once, I used to believe that the furthest I can see is my entire world, not knowing that countries exist, not knowing people of different cultures exist, stories exist, and languages exist. And here I am today speaking in front of you. My educational journey has given me the confidence and the tools to believe that I can achieve anything I want. And likewise, I want you to believe that you can achieve anything you want to all the young girls around the world. You can do it. Just remain passionate and remain curious. That's all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shova. Such an inspiring story. And you tell it so beautifully. I really can imagine your village in Calicote and, um, and those memories are precious. So thank you so much for sharing it. Our, our next speaker is Maggie Doyne, um, who is the, the one of the co-founders of Blink Now. And I'm going to begin with just a personal story because I came to know Maggie and Blink Now because my daughter was um, one of her biggest fans, uh, probably going on 10 years ago now. Um, and, and through my daughter's enthusiasm, her, her, her enthusiasm ultimately led her to study in Nepal and to get to meet Maggie and work with Maggie in person. Um, and it's been, a, it's been a personal pleasure of mine to see the amazing work that Maggie has, has started here in this organization that she has built. So Maggie, for those of you who don't know her, is originally from New Jersey and has dedicated the last 13 or more years of her life to educating children and empowering women. She was the recipient of the 2015 CNN Hero of the Year Award, and her work has been recognized by the Dalai Lama, by Elizabeth Gilbert, Nick Kristoff, Katie Couric, Prince Harry and Duchess Meghan of, of Sussex, um, and the list goes on. And while Maggie's work as CEO is focused on Nepal, she speaks all over the world in the hope of inspiring others to start projects of their own that will generate positive change. And while most people are, are familiar with Blink Now's work with children, maybe a little lesser known is the incredible work that they do with women in Nepal. And so I'm delighted to welcome Maggie to the conversation to share her story. Oh, thank you, Beth and Jagdish for hosting. And Soba, that just made me so emotional hearing hearing you speak as a as a grown woman and, and following your journey and um just loving your family so much. You all have just been so critical in, in the work that we do. So so thank you for getting us started and to the other speakers. I mean, just amazing global context. What I wanna do is share my screen and kind of take a journey to Nepal. <laughs> um, as much as I, I want you to see me, I really want you to see our work and the impact on the ground and um, the people who make our work what it is. So here we go. <laughs> so um, I'm just going to start on how I got to Nepal <laughs> really quick in case you're new to the journey. Um, I was just a regular girl from 
suburban New Jersey, playing soccer, um, destined for college, working on my SAT score and my resume and like really wanting to get on the track for success. Um, but I had no idea who I was or what I wanted to be. I'd never really left New Jersey. And just by chance and, and the incredible privilege, I got to take a gap year, um, which is a year of travel and cultural immersion and travel experience around the world. It started as just outdoor adventure and, um, you know, environmental work here and there, scuba diving, surfing, uh, learning about Buddhism on a monastery. And just by chance, I ended up in northeastern India in Rishikesh, um, where I got to know Sunita. Um, this is actually Sova's sister. We became really good friends. Um, we were really similar age. I was trying to figure out who I was in the world, what my purpose was, where I wanted to go, who I wanted to be, what I wanted to study in college and, and, and university about, about to make that major investment. Um, Sunita had left her village at a very young age, like Sova was telling you, and, and she wanted to kind of figure out where she came from and what had happened and figure out her Nepal identity as a young refugee living in India. So it was the year 2005, and the borders had kind of just opened up. Nepal was in the midst of an armistice, finding its way to peace agreements between the Maoists and the Nepali government in the Civil War. And us two young teenagers um, decided to make a trip to her village. You heard Sova talk about her memories. Um, it took us three days uh, to reach Kalikot and this little village by foot. And it was the hardest, most difficult journey, I think physically I've ever been on. Um, it took us multiple days on a rickety bus up through the Indian border and we crossed over on an ox cart. Um, and yeah, I just remember my earliest memory was the bus driver being like, girls, girls, time to get out. This is the end of the road and, and having no idea what lie ahead of us. We landed upon Sunita's village and came to know that her home had actually been converted into the Maoist rebel base camp. The schools had been ransacked and taken over and shut down. Temples had been burned. Families had been separated. Um, but there was also this contrast of beauty that I think Soba explained so, so well, just stunning beauty, pride of country, um, everybody working together, uh, just being so humbly welcomed in such an in incredibly beautiful place um, where everyone relied on each other and subsistence farming um, and a rural life in the Himalayas. So it was a really transformational experience to watch my dear friend kind of go through that journey of finding herself. And we also just <laughs> fell in love with Nepal like everyone does when you go there. It was impossible not to see the um, harsh effects of civil war, poverty, and the role that it plays in the daily lives of girls and women. And I really saw that in the faces and the stories that we heard. This was a little girl named Lalkota, and she was a child porter. And we watched her carry a load of about 160 pounds on her back, back and forth from the bus station to the little trading post um, in order to make a living and, and survive. And I remember as a young 18 year old, really just reflecting on my own life and what I was doing at that age, like playing on the soccer field, going to my first dance, um, babysitting for fun on the weekends, nothing, nothing like that of the reality. And I just, it was so unfair. It felt like we're exactly the same and yet I was given so much and the reality of girls in Nepal was so different. Um, you're probably wondering, wondering at what point I like just decided to move there and kind of make this big shift and, and, and change in my life course. And it was really little steps, one bit of at a time, but there was this moment on a dry riverbed where I looked up and I just saw dozens of children breaking rocks and they were getting huge 
rock soccer ball size from the riverbed and breaking them into with mallets into little pieces of gravel. Mm -hmm. And I asked like, what's going on? And um, the kids were selling the rocks for about a dollar every single day um, in order to survive. And that was the moment that kind of just brought me to my knees and I started to question everything, um, everything I thought I knew growing up in the suburbs of New Jersey, everything I thought about our human family, where we were going. Um, and I just, I felt really sad. I felt really hopeless. We knew that there were stats of about 1 million orphan children within Nepal following civil war. We knew the effects and that it had played on women, but there was just something in the humanity of looking at these stories face to face and, and seeing really a reflection of another human being who could be my, myself or ourselves. It, it really stopped me in my tracks. It was again, 2005, 2006 at this point, um, we started to realize the global and economic impact of education and access to education and basic literacy just a few years of primary school education can change the trajectory, break the cycles of poverty um, generationally forever. Um, the big moment for me was meeting Hima on the riverbed. She was breaking rocks. She was looking through garbage in this little orange dress that you see here, but she stopped and she said, Namaste Didi, which means hello, big sister. Mm -hmm. Now everyone in Nepal <laughs> calls each other big sister or auntie. It's very familial and um, it's, a, it's a cultural practice, but I thought, you know, oh, she's calling me big sister and saying hello. And we locked eyes and I thought, okay, I can't do anything about the whole situation um, globally, but what would happen if HEMA got enrolled into school? What if we could just start um, with HEMA? How would her life change and what would happen? A few weeks later, Hima was enrolled into school. She was so happy, so full of joy. Her demeanor changed. Um, she had a single mom and it just took a little bit of convincing and a $5 admission fee, the cost of a backpack, shoes, uh, too much of a financial barrier for the single mom to carry, but with a little bit of babysitting money and some good Nepali translating by my friend Sunita and just learning about the local area of Sirket, um, things started to change. And that was really the beginning of the journey. We um, started on this little kind of corner of the earth, started on the riverbed, started with enrolling kids into school. Uh, early on in the journey, I, I, again, I was so welcomed by the community and the local people and local women to really help and humble me and answer questions and, and really teach and guide me. And luckily, I was young enough um, to know that I knew nothing. <laughs> and I needed to get a lot of answers. But we could see really clearly in, in, as we started to work through case by case on the riverbed, at the bus station with child laborers, um, the orphan population that we were missing something like a kid can go to school, which is this hierarchy of needs. But underneath that is, you know, malnutrition, access to clean water, um, making sure that a child makes it to the age of five uh, with vaccines, immunizations, a safe home to live, a loving, supportive family um, to come back to. So there were all these other pieces in order for a child to succeed and thrive and grow that really needed to be met. I met my co-founder, Tope. He was also an orphan at the age of nine. He lost his mom and dad. Um, he'd gone to India to work as a child porter and just moved his way up the ranks. He has this incredible success story. And he really wanted to go back to Nepal following the crisis and, and be a part of the solution. Um, and luckily, we joined forces. And we really saw that what we needed was a whole community approach, a whole child approach. Um, and really to be deeply rooted in community for long-term sustainable change. And at the cornerstone of that, we knew was, was girls and women. We created um, just off the bat, just a little basic home and center for the kids. You can see, <laughs> um, uh, this is the point where Lil Sova right in the middle in the pink t-shirt um, moved back uh, with, with her family um, and they were just so instrumental in, in the early days. Her and her parents are, are co-parents with me. Um, 
but that's Nisha on the left, who was the first little girl who came into our home in Goma and, and little Krishna Bogati. Um, just case by case, child by child, we took on an approach of enrolling into school and, and providing everything. We got a big grant and little by little just built and we started um, with education at the foundation, but we also realized that kids needed deparasiting medication. They needed um, school lunch and nutrition. They needed mental health counseling and services, uh, social workers to help their growth and development in the community, government rights and advocacy. There was just all of these pieces and we built that in Coppola Valley out of bamboo and rock and that was the start. Obviously starting with the medical clinic um, and just all of the pieces of a, of a puzzle, including after school programs like soccer and homework support, um, drama, poetry, all of the happy, joyous things. <laughs> a lot of the girls who come into our home um, have lost everything, ev everything and everyone that they know. And it's been really powerful to watch and see how they take care of each other. We really wanted, again, girls and women at the center, and we wanted the children to grow up seeing Nepali aunties and role models um, other than just me. So we are a beautiful, robust team now. We're about 100 strong between all of our programs. And the school is where you'd want your kid to go to school. We really emphasize quality. Um, you know, enrollment has just increased so much in the last decade. I think it's a really positive thing to note that we're at the highest uh, female enrollment into school that the world has ever seen. So yes, we have so far to go, um, but little by little, step by step, we're closing that gender gap. And the only way to do it is to fight just case by case, child by child, you know, kiddo by kiddo, <laughs> woman by woman, and ensure that rights and, and advocacy and education are met. All of the girls at Coppola Valley School are the first in their generation to learn how to read and write. We have access to a library and that's been really powerful to, to watch and, and just see. When I went to um, Nepal for the first time, I was way younger and it was 15 years ago and I couldn't meet a woman who could read or write even maybe her own name above the age of 30. And now we're seeing girls and women coming in so strong and that that education level is getting higher and higher. Food and nutrition are really critical to what we do. Again, that whole child and everything they need. And um, I can't not end with our Women's Center. When we were looking at ways to address a child and how they can be successful mm -hmm. in community and become a change maker and, and stop that cycle of of poverty, we realized that we had to include women and caregivers and at the center of every home. And as Nick Kristoff from the Chinese proverb quoted, they hold up half the sky. Um, so early on in, in our approach, we decided to launch the Coppola Valley Women's Empowerment and Training Center. And I just remember on the first day, we kind of put out notice, oh, would you want to be part of a, a woman's center and get some training, um, maybe some basic literacy empowerment course? Uh, I just remember our doors flooded. We had like, we had to pull in chairs and benches. I think we had like 250 women show up from the community from a basic notice. Now, each and every year, we train anywhere from 60 to 100 women. And... The course is everything from business 101, finance, parenting, confidence building, um, and a vocational skill. We bring in a, a female human rights attorney to help navigate cases of domestic violence. Um, and the women really just come together, uh, learn a skill for financial viability. We have weaving, we have sewing, um, again, just going back in time, I often say that the women and girls in the Women's Center are the women who missed out on educational opportunities, but it's not too late. So we offer a, a literacy course and segment to that. Um, almost every single woman who comes into the program is a widow or reports high cases of domestic violence. Um, and when they graduate, 
from the program, they all say that what they found most inspiring was just the friendships and emotional support in each other, which was an unexpected outcome. They all take care of each other. They have friendships. They look after each other's children. They take to the streets and protest um, when a woman in the community is struggling or there's a case and they advocate for each other and just seeing them lead the space and, and take on the community and, and become leaders has been incredible. They're so strong and such a force. It's been our favorite program that we've run, which isn't how we started at all. We weren't starting out with the intention of bringing women into the picture, but it just became so critical that if you want a happy child, um, a safe child in and outside the gates of Coppola Valley, we bring women in. This is a beauty parlor training course, which has been incredibly successful. Um, and this is a graduation ceremony, which is really powerful. Many of the women go on and they have access to microloans and then can launch their own businesses. And that's been something that we've been taking on this year. We started to kind of watch our own data and realize that a lot of girls, um, we were losing them to child marriage. We were losing them to the practice of child putty, which is menstrual, um, a menstrual practice where girls have to go sleep in the shed while they're menstruating. And um, we kind of had child trafficking. We, we, we just saw so many risks, even with every single intervention in the world. And um, we launched uh, just four years ago, a Big Sisters Home, which is a safe home for girls who are... Um, going through high profile cases, whether it be an early child forced marriage or a sexual assault in the community. Um, we don't identify the faces of the girls we serve um, or the location, but it's been critical and life changing. And right when we opened the center serving the ages of girls 12 and above, we saw those child marriage rates go directly down. I just wanted to end on on um, one little story, about three years ago, I, I not only did I get to be a mom <laughs> in Nepal and, and take on a mother figure role, um, I also had a biological daughter named Ruby. And, and while I was on maternity leave, um, my oldest daughter, <laughs> Nisha, who'd been the first little girl to come into our home, called me and she said um, she'd been wildly successful, just super smart kid. Um, she got a scholarship to go to college. She wanted to be a doctor, but she's called me up and said, I have to tell you something, mom. I really, I, I'm going to go to college, but I got this incredible opportunity with Global Citizen Year and I want to take a gap year. <laughs> so she ended up, this is Nisha and the story came full circle. I got to drop her off at Stanford <laughs> for her orientation and she took a gap year um, around the world and is just about to graduate university. Just to end on another happy story, where did Hema end up? <laughs> Hema, um, after all of these years is also starting college um, she's studying hotel hospitality and is absolutely thriving and continues to, I just continue to watch her bloom. The word Coppola in Nepali means to bloom or to blossom. And uh, she's been incredible. The What I've learned, um, this is the best way to change the world. Access to education, giving girls and women a chance. It is long, it is slow. It takes time. We fight bit by bit, inch by inch, but it works. Um, it works in peace building, in changing communities. It works more than anything I've ever seen. And I'm so convinced in every cell of my body that this is the way to a more peaceful planet, um, to a planet where everyone can thrive and be taken care of and a world where every child is safe and educated and loved. Um, but like we said, and like every speaker said here today, we have so far to go. We've got 152 million children globally who are victims of child labor. The pandemic itself um, has created a 400 million gap of children who have not had access to schooling for the last 18 months. And we're looking at a backslide of education, um, poverty, early marriage, hunger. So we're gonna have to really come together one in three children in Nepal participate in child labor. 
one in three girls are still married before their 18th birthday. The increase um, in percentage of the child born to a mother who can read is actually 50%. That's huge. Um, so again, that simple education. We've had to step up in ways that we never have before with the pandemic. Women are going to lose their migrant work abilities. They're losing that daily wage labor. Um, and this, as we said, has disproportionately affected women and their children. Um, Blink now has had to step up in many ways that we never expected through a migrant crisis and food issues, and we're still working on it. You can get involved by following us on social media. We're Blink now. You can make a contribution. You can join our Roots program, um, which directly supports our students and our kiddos um, with whatever their needs may be, a, a small donation as, as small as $2 a month. And uh, thank you so much for following our story and our journey and participating today. Thank you so much, Maggie. I never tire of hearing this story. It, it lights my day, inspires me every time. And the notion that any one of us can really have an impact just by taking that first step. You know, we don't need to be overwhelmed by by the troubles of the world when there's something that we can do today. And it's really wonderful that you that you did that. Um, if I could ask, if I could ask a question to start us off, and I know we, we have about 10 minutes left, so I invite everybody listening. If you have a question you want to ask, just write it in the comment box and we will try to address it. I will say I'm I um our first speaker, Latanya Mapfret, had to leave um, early for another engagement. So I'm sorry that she won't be here to answer any questions, but but Sova and Barti are still here as well as Maggie. So please feel free to, to ask any question. But um, one question for Maggie, um, is there a story uh, from the Women's Center in particular that is your favorite success story to share of the impact that the center has had on women in Nepal? I have one from this year. Um, you know, we, we were researching ways to, we learned early on, like, hey, women don't need, like, courses in nutrition, or, like, they know how to care for their families, they know how to care for their children, they just don't have the financial wherewithal because of the lack of education, because of the lack of jobs. Um, so we were doing a lot of market research on what to do, and we brought in weaving. And in our very first class, there was this woman named Nirmala, who just really took to the training. She loved it. By the end of the class, she'd gone out and, and bought her own loom. She'd hired a few other women from the class. Um, and just we just watched her in awe. Like that's the thing, when you make an investment in girls and women, you don't have to do anything. You kind of just then stand back and watch them <laughs> and watch them take on and, and, and do their thing. Because again, they know what they need to do. They, they have it within them. But um, this year, it's been, it's been, I think, five years since she joined the training center. She came back to become the weaving teacher. And this year, she was named one of Nepal's entrepreneurs of the year um, wow. for, for her business in weaving and looming. And she makes beautiful products. So that's, that was one of my favorites from the year. I was like, what? <laughs> we have an entrepreneur of the year? And that's wonderful. But there's been small wins too, like a woman able to sell her vegetables because she knows basic numeracy and not get cheated, or a woman who leaves a violent, you know, relationship and other women take her into their home and support her children. It's it's the small little little things and big things too. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, let's see, for Barty, I, I wonder if you could comment on how, how can individuals here in the U.S. or anywhere that they're listening from um, really help the situation in Nepal, try to make a difference in Nepal? How can people get involved? Thanks for that trillion dollar question, Beth. <laughs> um, and and it, it, it is really a trillion dollar question because what is happening in Nepal is uh, social norms and values have not changed. And that is why today girls and women are at the receiving end. You know, we have a woman as a president. We had a woman as a speaker of the house. We had a chief justice as a woman. But when these women do not represent the real women on the ground, they really cannot make a difference. It is just very tokenistic. So I think as individuals, we really need to be aware 
of the social norms and values. And I really stress on that because that makes a big difference in the mindset of the people. Even today, violence against women and girls continues in spite of those stringent legislation. You know, we've had horrendous um, incidents. So many Kalpanas, so many Bimalas, so many Bhagirathis have been gang raped and the state has been unable to deliver justice to them, as well as stop violence against girls and women. So it is really about changing the mindset. It is really about reflecting and pausing what is happening to us. And, and it is really about questioning why are these unjust norms and values still there in spite of Nepal being one of the most peace-loving, for now, I would say, you know, and where, as Maggie said, people are so friendly, they're so welcoming, they're so open, they're so trusting, but the way they treat their women and girls is really something to be uh, questioned about. So individuals and uh, even communities, I would say even the state, we just need to be or, or spread more awareness, advocate continuous advocacy, and collective action and collective leadership is required, no matter where anyone is. And Maggie really embodies that individual you know, uh, effort to transform girls' lives. And thank you, Maggie. You shared such a wonderful story. It really touched my heart. I wish there were more people like you. Thank you. Well, I think I think Maggie is generating lots more people like her, which is uh, which, which actually leads me to my next question for Sova. So, I, I'm you know having having lived in the Copa, uh, lived lived with lived through this um, and been educated in this system. Are, is there any particular insight you can share from your experience as a student at the Copa Valley School um, or about the Copa Valley Home that um, that would help enlighten our listeners as to what your like what your experience has been like? Um, I would say I definitely miss the staff, like because I was in the I was in the children's home, so my experience is a little bit different from the students that only attended the school because I would spend the whole time in, in inside the home with like fifty children, right? And there was never a dull moment. There was always something exciting going on in different corners of the house, and. I I lived in a I lived in the girls' floor, and all of us would be always down to do something, whether it's like playing guitar and singing along, or going down to the kitchen and like cooking, or whether it's going to the school to play soccer. It was someone something was always happening, and I really enjoyed that. And we were very active in different things. Um, yeah, I would just say like being involved in anything you can and taking all those opportunities in would be the biggest thing. If you're, yeah, that's what, that's what I would say. That's so wonderful. Um, well, I, I don't, if, a bit, we have about two minutes left, so I'm gonna give one more shout out to anybody listening. If you have a question, now's the time to ask it. Um, <laughs> but if not, I guess I will, um, I will just ask each of our speakers here to, um, if, if they have any closing remarks they'd like to say or anything that they um, would like to share about how we continue to spread the goodwill that is that's happening throughout um, throughout Nepal with the efforts of Maggie and others that are, are looking to improve the lot of women and the and the kind of intergenerational impact that the investment can really have. Yeah, I'll start. Um, I think um, <laughs> it's so sorry, Didi. Um, yeah, I just think that we can get so overwhelmed with it just the trauma and the tragic stories and, and feel like we're so far behind. I mean, this is just such an issue and continues to be an issue that we're still battling day to day in developed countries and developing countries. Um, and I think in those moments of hopelessness or feeling like we're going backwards, um, just remember that, again, one child at a time, being there for each other as women and holding each other up and mentoring each other and cheering for each other. Someone asked, is there something we can do besides donate? And yes, there's so much. I think women, we can support women. We can uplift each other. We can be cheerleaders for each other. Um, 
and just not lose hope. Just one one woman, one girl at a time. That would be my my little tidbit. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Beth. Um, maybe I would like to say that education is a key entry point. You know, for um, starting that process of empowerment. But the way our education is being um, uh, taught or the curriculums are being designed, they really don't promote gender equality or women's empowerment. That is why I really believe in Paule Freire's, the reflect approach, which is about raising consciousness. It is not just about raising awareness, but raising consciousness through a reflection through questioning of your status quo that leads to problem solving. You don't wait for somebody to solve your problem. You identify your own problem and you seek solutions to that. And that is how collective action and collective solidarity can be achieved to transform the status quo. Therefore, uh, I think what Maggie is doing there is great. Uh, and we also need to involve the parents and the community because very often parents and the community don't change. It's only the students who change. And when students, only students change, there is still that resistance, you know, whether it be cultural or social or based on caste, based on religion. And that is very difficult to address. Therefore, yes. we need to involve the parents and the community in general using that reflect approach. And I think that is very much important because even today, the education curriculum still has a very strong gender bias. You can see that in the graphics, in the examples that they um, you know, produce. And the education ministry, we have been um, interacting with the education ministry, but still it is a long haul. Therefore, I think individuals matter but collective actions really make the difference. Thank oh, you. Thank you so much. That's a wonderful note to, to close on because we, we, we all need to come together to address this. I want to invite my co-host Jagdish back on to, uh, to close us out and offer any closing remarks. Well, thank you. It's such an amazing story. Oh my God. I, we have to continue this dialogue, I think. Um, but I must thank you, Latanya, Maggie, Bharti, and Sova for your amazing, wonderful, um, deliberations. Um, Beth, for your hard work in bringing all, uh, bringing this event uh, to this level. Um, I would also like to thank everyone who registered and participating right now, specifically from Kopila Valley School, uh, Blink Now Foundation, people from Nepal and all over the world. Um, I also like to thank my own development committee, Leslie, John, and everyone, all the uh, development committee members who supported to organize this event. And thank you, Linji, for all your communication and technical support. And last but not least, Bidisa, without you, this program could not have been done. So thank you, everyone. We'll continue. Bye now.